Before looking at discourse analysis, I'm going to just quickly review the discipline that it fits into. So discourse analysis comes to us from linguistics. Um, David Crystal tells us that linguistics is the science of language and linguists are the people who uh, try to understand why human language is the way it is. So linguists study the history and acquisition of language and its structure and use. So I'm just going to pick apart that structure use distinction a little bit. So on the sort of the, the structural side, we have these different areas of linguistics. So um, structural linguistics is interested in the formal properties of language. So it includes things like word structure, which we find studied in morphology. Um, so that's like how you make a participle from a root word, uh, you know, so run, running, so that kind of add an ing word structure. Then there are phonological and phonetic areas of linguistics. These are to do with the study of sounds and how sound is used to make meaning. So phonetics is the study of how we can differentiate between sounds. What's the minimum difference that can be used for meaning? And then phonology is the set of sounds used by a particular language. So the human voice can produce many different phonetic distinctions, but in any one language we only have a limited set of phonological ones. Um, syntax is the examination of how uh, meaningful structures are put together out of different words. So if we had phrases like the famous syntactic one, is the cat sat on the mat, that's syntactically correct, you know, it works, it's functional. And then we could have also had the cat purred on the mat, that would equally be functional. You could even have something like the cat juggled on the mat, which whilst it might not make sense, is still syntactically legit, you know, it works, because juggled is the, the past tense of a verb. Um, so the fact that the, the cat juggled on the mat would not would perhaps be seen as nonsense, that's a kind of semantics thing, so what we're looking at there is how a whole phrase has meaning or, or stands in defiance of conventions on meaning. Um, so that's that looks at what the meaning of a whole group of words might be, so a sentence or a phrase or a clause. Pragmatics looks at the meanings that aren't present but are somehow indicated by a uh, syntactic arrangement. So if you've ever said to somebody, are you putting the kettle on, and really meant, will you make me a cup of tea, that's a kind of pragmatic usage. On the other side here we've got these kind of use things, so there's psycholinguistics, it's how we develop and acquire language, historical linguistics, how languages change and develop over time, varieties of language, so slang, creoles, uh, pigeons. These are um, a fascinating area of study but one that's not terribly relevant to what we're going to do. But this side of the thing is, so sociolinguistics is looking at how social conventions, norms, values, the rules governing our behaviour get inscribed into the language that we speak. So we live in a culture where gender distinction is very important and we can see that inscribed in our language in terms of we have different verbal forms and different pronoun forms for males and females. Um, then there's these two things here which these are more relevant to us again, so discourse analysis is the thing we're actually interested in today, conversation analysis, I'm going to just treat that as a special case of discourse analysis, some people will be upset by that, but it's, I've got to shorten this. Discourse analysis looks really at how sociolinguistic value gets inscribed in the language as it is being used, and it pretty much uses things like semantics and pragmatics, and it borrows some bits of this syntactics as well, um, in order to, to do that inquiry. So we're going to look at the overlap between these different things. This is Leo Spitzer, and many people think of him as the founder, the, the granddad of um, discourse analysis. Uh, that's given that people like to have a starting place for anything. Leo Spitzer is as good a start as anywhere. But really, you know, we've we've been looking at discourse and, and working out how it means what it means way back. You know, go back to the Greeks. Beyond that, I think any time people who've used language, they've wanted to know how it works. So, from Leo's perspective, discourse analysis is the examination of any significant semiotic event, which is not a brilliant definition, to be fair, because it was defining the thing that we didn't know, discourse analysis, in reference to something we've probably never even heard of, significant semiotic event. So what is this? What's semiotic? Well, <clears throat> way back in the day, semiotics was the study of how signs function in the construction of meaning. And, the, you know, if we talked sort of three, four hundred years ago, People would have talked about the semiotics of medicine or agriculture, meaning so how you interpret material traces of illness. So the doctor sees the spots on the skin and interprets it in terms of measles. So if we think about that in a more formal way, by the time we get to the 19th century, we're looking at these two gentlemen here. This is Charles Sanders Peirce. He was an American. I may not be saying his name entirely correctly. Uh, I know something unusual about the way he said his name, but I don't quite know what it is. 
he's a, a pragmatist, an uh, American philosopher. Um, he was a, a person who inspired some of the great names of American philosophical tradition, particularly Dewey, um, and also to some extent uh, the James brothers, William and um, I forget the guy's name now. Anyway, he's, he was an important philosopher from America, and he, he says that a sign is something that stands in for something else in some respect or capacity. And, and once he sort of made that claim, the thing that's most interesting what it does is the respects and capacities of the sign. So how can a thing stand in for something else? So he says signs can be iconic. So they can be similar in some way to the thing they stand in for. So these are signs for a bell. So if somebody says ding dong, or if somebody drew that picture or presented it to you on a screen, and it made you think of bell, these are then iconically representing the bell. And they're iconic because they are similar to the object they stand in for in some way. Yeah, so this is supposed to sound a bit like the noise a bell makes. This is supposed to look a bit like a bell. All right. He also says you've got indexical signs. So here, you get the bell in the same way. So the thing that's being stood for is, is a bell. But this time, it's the noise made by this guy as he rattles this thing. <coughs> if you hear a ringing sound, a clang, clang, clang noise, then you have a tendency to think there must be a bell nearby. So the sound indicates is an index of the presence of a bell. And it could be a logical relationship as well. So if somebody says that they are a brother, that indicates that they have a sibling in their immediate family, you know, a brother or a sister themselves. So it would be hard to see how somebody could be an only one and a brother. And then uh, Pierce also says that there are symbolic signs where the standing in for is achieved just by convention. So we use the sound B-E-L, you know, the word bell, but we could equally as well use the word chime or any other word at all. You know, we could use the word sandwich. There's no reason why bell has anything to do with bells any more than any other sound we could make. Right, so this is the other dimension. This is the side of the coin, if you like, and this comes from Ferdinand de Saussure. He was a famous Swiss linguist, famously could speak a wide variety of languages with considerable fluency, um, and thought and wrote on the nature of the sign, but in a different dimension. So he's not so much interested in different types as, as the internal mechanics. So he would basically agree with Peirce when he says that, that you know one thing stands in for another, but he says, well, these two parts of the sign then. So there's the thing that does the standing in for, which he calls a signifier. And that would be like the marks or sounds or gestures that we read, hear, or observe. And then there are the signifieds. That's the things that are being stood in for. So here we've got a bunch of sounds, lion, leo, simba, all of which can be used to stand in for this. So those are the, the two halves of the sign. But the other thing that he says that's important is that Sure observes that this relationship is arbitrary. And it doesn't just mean that, you know, it's not just that we could say sandwich and mean bell. It's not just that we could say... Um, you know, we have lion, or we could say Leo, or we could say Simba, and mean the same thing. It's also arbitrary that we group particular objects into the same class. So we have a specific class of objects that we call lion, and it excludes leopards. But it could include them. That's an arbitrary distinction we drew there. Um, and people get upset about this sometimes, so they say, well, look, there is a, there's a natural difference between a lion and a leopard. And, and yes, maybe there is, but also there are natural distinctions within the group that we call lions. So you get lions from certain types, you know, certain places which are, are quite different to others. They may be able to reproduce, but you can also get different big cats to reproduce with one another that aren't lions and produce hybrids. So the idea here is that there isn't this kind of uniform, homogenous, naturally occurring object. It's an arbitrary class that we've put together. So person de Saussure both taken different approaches to signs, but what their work brings out is that there is something arbitrary and conventional in the way the signs work. And this is going to be important for discourse analysis because in discourse analysis we aim at finding this arbitrary and conventional dimension of making meaning, the semiosis. So why are we doing that? Well, we're so familiar with semiotic processes that, that go on around us, we often don't see the arbitrary and the conventional, and so we can be, in a way, hijacked by it. Um, just as the fish is always in the water, in, and therefore loses sight of the water, we very often lose sight of the fact that we're constantly engaged in semiosis, the, the interpretation, 
of meaning making. So we behave as though some of the meanings that we work with aren't arbitrary and conventional, that the world is not necessarily the way we think it is, but it could be chopped up in other ways. So we could use different sounds to mean the same objects, or we could actually divide the object that we're referring to up in different ways. So this arbitrariness tends to disappear from us just as quickly as we start to interpret signs. But we can sometimes recover these, the assumptions about this arbitrariness by listening carefully to the language, and that's what discourse analysis does. So wherever we hear somebody catching something up as natural or common sense, and it used to be the case that people did the same thing with them, natural religion or, or traditional religion, sorry, that religion, nature and common sense are sometimes the alibis for the arbitrary and the conventional. And we do this because arbitrary conventions in language that we have forgotten and turned into natural or commonsensical distinctions are often used to disguise the arbitrary and conventional distribution of power. For example, 200 years ago, my ancestors went to North Africa and stole people from there and forced them to work on plantations in appalling circumstances so that my ancestors could enjoy um, sugar and cotton and coffee and, and stuff like that. And um, when, whenever people have engaged in slavery, other people have always criticised it. And whenever those criticisms arose, the answer would very often be dressed up in terms of nature and common sense and also religion back in the day. So that it was argued that so that the religious discourse might say something like, well, they were they were mired in sin, you know, they hadn't heard the good news of Jesus, and being mired in sin and caught up in that, they were going to go to hell. So we went there and we took them the good news, and where they refused to listen, we forced them to, to accept it. Because that it was our responsibility to bring them to God. Um, the, the, as soon as you start to say it's okay to force people to believe what you believe. It's a very short step to forcing them to work on your plantation, it seems. Then we also had people arguing from nature, and they would say, well, black people are just naturally not as able to look after themselves as white people, so the white person has to do the looking after, and therefore the black person owes the white person a debt of responsibility. You know, so so they, they then have to... I take on responsibility for their um, good management, so they owe me their labour kind of thinking. And then there were common sense arguments. People would say, well, the fact that we can turn them into slaves means that, just common sense, we will turn them into slaves. And there's something horrible being said about human nature, that people will exploit one another, being dressed up as common sense. So those three discourses, and, and the, the religion one hasn't, hasn't been maintained as much as that nature and common sense, but those three discourses have been used to disguise the arbitrary assumption of power. Just a quick um, wander off into to thinking about language then. So this is Martin Heidegger. He's not as popular a character as um, he used to be, and certainly his, you know, some of his motives were fairly questionable. Some of his political activities in the mid-20th century is a bit dubious. But he, he argues that language is like a hammer. Um, so when we're using it to do stuff, we don't think about it too much. If you think about the hammer, you'll hit yourself with it. But when it breaks down, when it goes wrong, you really notice how it works. It's only when it starts to fail you that you really begin to think about what it does when it's useful. And then there's this guy, he's a bit later than Heidegger, this is Roland Barthes. He's a French, um, he's a journalist, cultural commentator and academic. And he suggests that, that photographs, and by this he means any sign, but he, he was particularly interested in how photographs function as signs. So he says a photograph is always invisible. We never see the photograph, which you think, what? That doesn't make any sense. Of course, it's a perfect illustration. I already said this is Roland Barthes. And it's not Roland Barthes, it's a photograph of Roland Barthes. But it's very hard for us to see the photograph as a photograph. We look through it and believe we see the person. Of course, we don't see the person. That's not Roland Barthes at all. And just as it is a photograph, it's a photograph of a particular place and a person. So if we really, really thought about it, it's just a bunch of coloured lights and shades, isn't it? But this is Bart's point. The, the sign disappears as soon as we see it, because what we do is interpret it. And it's, it's how we forget that that discourse analysis tries to focus on. And that'll do for now, I think.